Thank you, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Standing to honor the word of God, we stand to honor the Lord's word, and thank you so much for standing. Uh, because this is a house of honor, and honor always bling, brings blessing. And thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you here. The smart dollar is always to sit in front. In the front row are the people who always, I find over the years, that uh, these are the guys who really succeed in life. Not that you don't and sitting behind, okay? But I believe that all my heart, okay, that uh, there's a reason for sitting in front. I always sat in front when I was a young Christian. And the way I am today, I believe that's one of the reasons. <laughs> All right, just playing, playing with you, okay? All right, just having fun. Okay, let's see now. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this word today. May you bless everyone here. May all the people that are here realize, Lord, Father, how young they are, Lord. If they're below 100, they're young, Lord. Father, I want to thank you, God, for the wonderful things you're going to do here today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Next week is going to be a really fun week. Next week is going to be a very exciting week. Next week, we have Father's Day on Sunday. And then on Thursday to Sunday, we have Soul Out Camp as well. Woo, come on, guys. Let's hear it. Yeah, Soul Out is basically the youth camp that we have every two years. There's going to be about 100 plus youth that are going to be there. And it's going to be fire. It's going to be revival. And uh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be have worship at 2 a.m., uh, that kind of thing. That's common in our youth camps. And uh, it's so awesome that every two years when we see what God's doing, it's just uh, fantastic. We have 10 Cambodians coming. Uh, 10 Cambodian youths are coming from Cambodia to join Soul Out Camp because they heard about it as well. Woo, come on. It's going to be great. So if you can, on the night, night rallies are available for everyone to join. Um, if you feel young, young, you want to join them during the camp itself, sure, reg- register. You know, they'll welcome you. But if not, you'll come for the night rally. It's going to be fun. Go and support the young people. When I say young, I'm not talking about kids. I'm talking about our impact uh, service on Saturday is for young people and for them to, uh, to really know the Lord and to be risen up, as, uh, to be confident to lead in, uh, in all kinds of ministries. And so the young people are going to be there in the 20s, uh, in the 30s, and in the 40s, and 50s, and 60s as well, okay? So come and join us, and I believe you're going to have a great time. Support them. I think it's going to be great, all right? And um, so that's happening next weekend, and also next weekend, pray for us as well, for myself and Pastor Paul and Pastor Ping and Richard and uh, Dr. Darren. We are going to go to um, Africa. We're going to be uh, in Uganda, in Kampala, the, the main capital. Please pray for us. And we're going to minister to 500 pastors. We're going to teach them about how to do the prophetic, how to do the word of knowledge. Um, in that country, they, they find that there are so many fake prophets, so many witch doctors that they basically say, can we have a true prophet that will come and teach us? And last year I went there, God blew them out of the water, God, not me. And um, so this year they said they were going to bring 500 pastors together. You teach us all how to prophesy, do the word of knowledge with the purity of our heart, with the holiness of God. And I'm going to do that. I believe that this 500 are going to impact at least 50,000 people when they go back to their, to their different churches. Amen. So please pray for us, okay? All right. So, so a lot of happening next week. Uh, so Cam, uh, Youth Cam, Father's Day. Uh, church is going to send us out to do the things that we want to do and help people as well. So it's going to be really, really cool. So this week, be praying. So um, today, the title of my message is we are responsible for our own rewards. We're responsible for our own rewards. I'm not talking about salvation. Salvation is free. Grace of God, not by your works, lest anyone should boast. You're going to go to heaven. I'm talking about rewards. Reward is not, not salvation. Reward is not even blessing. Blessing is what you get on earth by the grace of God in your life. You're blessed with two legs, two hands, two eyes, with a face. And, um, you know, you can walk out of this place fine. It's by the grace of God that you wake up every morning. That's the blessing of God. That's not earned, okay? You may be praying and God gives to you, but anyway, it's grace by God. That's blessing. But reward is not blessing. Reward is what you get in heaven. Blessing is what you get on earth. And there's a difference. And a lot of people don't know that at all. They think that we're going to go to heaven and this is what's going to ha- happen in heaven. I'm going to be in shorts and t-shirts and straw hats. And I'm just going to basically chill every day and do nothing. My goodness, if you're going to do nothing for the rest of your life in eternity, that is a really boring life. I don't know how I can... I can't even spend three days not doing anything. All right? Maybe I'm ADHD, I don't know. But, but the thing is this, okay, is that... Is that, sorry, I saw somebody drop a coin, so my train of thought just went away. Uh, yeah, so, so 
Let me get back to trend. Alright, okay. Forget the coin, okay? I felt like the woman with the couple coin you know, looking for it, you know. Sorry, I go, I've got to pick it. Can somebody pick it up? It's so distracting. Thank you so much. And, uh, that's yours, okay? That's yours. I bless you with the coin, okay? Thank you, thank you. Now the distractions are gone, alright? So let's continue right now. And um, so and, and so you know, heaven is not a place where you do nothing. It cannot be. You know why? Because the Bible tells me that heaven is a very busy place right now. Heaven right now, they're they are warring for us. The heavenlies, they're fighting. It's good versus evil. It is, you know, the Archangel Michael and Gabriel and whoever else and Gabriel Tan and Gabriel Kim Hock and all that, guys. Not every, not every angel has an English name, all right, okay? So the angel Kim Hock and Gabriel Akao is fighting for us. And they are fighting, you know, and they are battling for us. Okay, and so heaven is right now busy. And I'm sure when we get there, we're going to join them in the fight as well for the rest of us. And so let me say this to you. Heaven is not going to be chill. It's going to be a place where you will work, but you are not stressed. You're going to be serving, but we're full of joy. You're going to be fighting, but with the grace of God and you're winning. It's, it's, that's heaven. Nowhere in the Bible, in the book of Revelations, the last book of the Bible, there's so many images, so many pictures that we describe a place where they are in their hammock, swaying by the rivers, and all that they are having, watching the sunset. It's not, it's not in Revelations. It is a busy place in heaven, amen, doing God's work. But they do it with the grace of God in their lives, and they're happily doing it. So, so, you know, Jesus wants us to be responsible for our rewards. But Jesus doesn't do it by conning you, by trying to control you, or by trying to coerce you. Because He doesn't fail, He doesn't force, but He comes to us trying to reach your understanding. Today's sermon is going to be challenging. I tell you this, okay? Not because I chose it that way, but because we're going through the whole every single parable of the Bible this year, okay? And so we're going through every parable of the Bible. Today, the parable is about Matthew chapter 25. It's about three guys. And the story of the parable that Jesus taught was about three of them. And one of them was given five talents. One was given two, and one was given one. Backstory, a bit of backstory. Last week, we talked about Luke 19. Another story about God giving um, minas to people, 10 of them. Each of you are given one, you go and produce it. One of them didn't. The rest, the story doesn't tell about the seven, but two more did produce and, and God rewarded them. The master rewarded them. Jesus was teaching that to the crowd. He was teaching at that time before he went, he went into Jerusalem and he was teaching to the people that was following him, including his disciples and the curious as well. And they got together and he taught them that you'll all be given something in life. And it's called a mina. A mina, they could understand what a mina was because a mina was probably about a couple of, of, of several weeks of wages. And he says that you go and multiply it, but there's one that did not and was punished. And then now, we now go to the next parable, which is connected, similar, but it's very different as well, about the story in Matthew 25, about now, Jesus now telling the story of two people that were chosen and they went and multiplied the five, took five and multiplied five and the one who had two multiplied the two, but the one didn't as well. But the whole story it had similarity to Luke 19 when he was way at that time, but now it's a different time. Now he's talking in that time when he's already in Jerusalem. It's a few weeks before his, his crucifixion. It is still, it's almost the end. So he was giving his parting words to another group of people that were not, well, there was not the curious, there was not the crowd, but was to his disciples. So this crowd here in Matthew 25 were basically the committed ones. The people who he was preparing to say, hey, you know what, get ready, because I'm going to go. And before I go, I'm going to tell you a story, a parable. I'm going to tell you this parable. You've heard the one before when you were with the crowd earlier on, 
but now I'm in Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you this story, but it's going to be a bit the same, but it's also going to be very different as well. So we're going to know the different. Why? How is that different? How is this story different from the one that we heard last week? So we've been traveling with parables this whole year. And so if you want to go hear it, go on YouTube. You can get all the parables in there. By the time we finish the year, we're going to try to cover all the parables of the Bible. And so now this story here, it's a very special story, but it's a very challenging story. And so today, you're going to be challenged. Okay? Get ready. Tell somebody next to you, you're going to be challenged. <laughs> Tell the person on the other side, say, he's talking about you. Okay? So if you ever wondered that somebody is preaching and they're talking about you today, the answer is yes. All right, he's talking to everybody, including myself, all right? So I want to say, say this to you as well. Uh, this morning, when I got up, I had the most difficult time to come to church. I felt this oppression on me, and you guys know I'm very sensitive spiritually. I felt this oppression on me that was really very strong. It was so heavy. I was driving a car, I was praying, and said, man, it's going to be so hard to preach. I don't know why there's this, there's this pushback that I couldn't preach at all. But, but it's nothing to do with BLS, this morning service. It's nothing to do with people. It's just this pushback. So I, I believe that, you know, um, but then when I preached after that, the, the breakthrough came. And, and, and I think that, you know, what we encountered just now in worship was just God just was plowing the ground. Worship plows the ground of the heart so that the hard ground becomes soft that when the word comes, as you speak in tongues, the super Wi-Fi connecting to God is really fast with your tongues. And then when you're worshipping God, the ground becomes soft. Then when we speak to you, when you're ready, then you're, you're ready to receive the word. Amen? Are you ready to receive the word today? Okay, it's going to challenge you, all right? But can you be challenged today? You know, can I don't be a comedian here this morning? All right? So challenge you today, all right? And so we can hear the word of God. So... So he goes and he tells this story in Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. This is a word for all of us here today. If you're a believer, you're a Christian, you're a disciple of Christ, you're nobody's disciple except Jesus Christ, amen? Okay, you're not mine, you're not, not anybody's, you're Christ. So Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30, he said, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted. Say with me, entrusted. Every one of you here, listen to me, you are entrusted. God has entrusted you with a talent. The story here about talent, before I read first, is that Amina, in Luke 18 last week, Amina was several weeks of wages. Now he's talking to them about talent. A talent is worth 20 years of, of, of salary. So he's talking about, to these guys, you are going to get something really valuable for me. This has a lot of weight, there's a lot of influence, a lot of power, and it's got a lot of great value that I'm going to put in you. So guys, I'm going to go, but I want to tell you this story to tell you what's going to happen to you if you understand your role and responsibility with what I'm going to give to you, which is a talent, not a mina, okay? So minas were for everybody in the crowd, but talent is for you sitting here today, okay? And so he says, to the one, he gave five talents to another two and another one, to each according to his ability. Say with me, according to his ability. Every one of you, you got different abilities. And it's good. It's fine. No one's better than the other person. I'm certainly not better than you. I'm just cold, that's all. All right? So now he says, all of you are going to have different abilities. I'm going to give you different, to your different abilities, I'm going to give you different things. And then, so let's go to verse 16, and you who had received the five went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. This is a story, all right? This is not, this is not reality. This is Jesus telling the parable. And so also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, say me, after a long time. After a long time. And I want to tell you today, you think that, you think, a lot of us think that God is not coming back for a long time and I can, I'm just going to do whatever I want. Wrong thinking. Wrong way to think. It's dangerous thinking. After a long time. So after a long time, the masters of those servants came and set out accounts with them. You know why I say you, it's the wrong thinking? Jesus may take longer than expected to come back, but your life is still only a few more years. 
Okay, then you're gonna meet him no matter what. Even if you don't see him come down, you're gonna meet him up there. So either way, you're gonna meet him. All right. And so, and now after a long time, the master of the mas- master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Settled accounts with them. That is a very key word. He will settle accounts with all of us. It will happen. It will happen. He will. Okay. All right. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents here. I have made five talents more. Master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Say to me, well done. well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I've set you over much. You've been faithful over little. I will set over you much. Faithful in little, faithful in much. That's how we train our leaders here. You do stuff that we tell you that's small. We see your faithfulness. We see you do it well. We know you can do big things well. All right? So faithful in little, faithful in much. That's how we test leaders. That's how Jesus does it. This is how we do it in NLCC. Okay? And then he said to the one, uh, you, um, where am I right now? Master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, be faithful over little, I'll set you in much, enter into the joy of your master. He, and he also who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and getting where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. And the master answered you, you wicked and slothful servant. I, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gathered where I scattered no seed. And then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming, I should have received what is my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who, had, who has the ten talent. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has, has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, that place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here we have a story here that is similar but very different from Luke 19. In Luke 19, the servant that didn't want to do what the master told him to do, he had a reprimand. But in here, he was severely punished. The expectation that God has on believers is going to be different. When you meet God, you're either going to receive a reward or a reprimand. There's only two. Here's not, reprimand doesn't mean you're going to send you to hell, but there'll be a reprimand. I believe that the, the Bible says that there'll be tears in heaven. Okay? In Revelation, it says there'll be tears in heaven. Those, what kind of tears are those? I, th- I, think, I think the tears that you will have in heaven will be tears of regret. You'll be regretting, I should have listened and done what is right. I should have heard the sermon and not let it just go in year, one year and come out the other year. I should have done what was right because I didn't and this is the road I took and this is the regret I have. So don't have tears in heaven where there's regrets in your life. But be able to say to the Lord God Almighty, say, God, I'm hearing your message today. Okay, so say to the Lord right now, say, I hear you, God. Come on, say it one more time. I hear you, God. The audience here are the people who are committed, who, are, who has a responsibility, who has accountability, and who says, I'm going to be faithful in doing it. The two of them that went to produce five and two, their, res- their result, the consequence, and the reward was the same. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have done well. Now enter into your father's joy. Both of them had equal result, equal reward. What is Jesus, why is Jesus telling them this story? And why is Jesus telling this story here in the Bible so that we can all learn from this story? It's because God wants us to know that today you need to hear the story of your life. This is the story of your life. This is what God is offering to you. This is a reminder. This is an adjustment. 
This is a shift that you must have in your life so that you understand that if God has put you Sunday morning here, there is a word that is for you, that every single one of us has got talents, abilities that God has given to us. That with the talents He's given to us, He wants us to faithfully go and pursue it. At the end of the day, when we meet God in heaven, or when He comes back again, whichever is faster, when you meet Him, He will ask you, He will settle the accounts of you. I gave you all these things. I gave you the ability to make money. What do you do with it? God's not, pro, not, God's not impressed with possessions. God is more impressed with what you do with His money. You will have to settle the accounts with Him. God is not just impressed with your ability to dance or to be able to do things. He's going to say, what do you do with that? So there will be settling of accounts. You, this is plain as light and day. It will happen. You can't run away from settling accounts with God and you will say, what have you done? And so that action is very important for us and to remind us, if God has gifted you with a voice, He's given you with the ability to serve, he's, you, are, you are able to do things that I even cannot, but use that. Use that for His glory because you will have to give an answer to the things that He's called you to do. You know, the things that sometimes we don't understand what heaven is like. Heaven is a place where we will come together and we can rejoice in what we've done here on earth. You know, in heaven, there is an account. You know there's an accounting method in heaven? There's an accounting method in heaven. It's called carry forward. Whatever you do here will be carried to the next life. So if the, if the things that you do here has got life, it will bring life. But if it doesn't, then you will have to understand that it will also, you will also have to pay the price. Matthew 16, I'm going to jump forward a little bit further, uh, quicker. Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. This is as plain as you can understand Scripture. There will be repayment. The repayment will be reward or reprimand. There will be a repayment. So what are you doing with that repayment from God? Don't just be accountable to your boss in your office, which is great. Be accountable to God, the big boss up there. And how you live your life here. Don't just live life where you just think. You know, the problem is that people don't understand that repayment according to what you've done means what you've done will be dependent on your attitude towards God. If your attitude towards God is that, you know what, what is being said, I don't really care. You know, he's telling us a story. The master told two of them, you know, do this. Yes, sir, I'm going to do it. I trust you because of what you say, and I respect you, and I honor you as my master. You give me five, I'm going to go produce it. You give me two, I'm going to produce it, because I take your word with weight. And then the one who says, you know what? Master spoke, give it to me, I took it, but you know what? I've got my own thing, man. You know, I'm not going to hustle for God. I've got my own side hustle that I need to take care of in my life. I've got no time. Why? Because this word has got no value to me. And so if it has no value to you, of course you don't want to do anything with it. But you're afraid, so you don't want to lose it. But you're not going to do anything with that. And then repayment will come. And that's, so Jesus reminds and tells them. And then he tells them again and again. And then Paul in the Bible talks about carry forward accounting in heaven. Whatever you do here, you'll be carried forward to the next life. It will. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians here, it says in chapter 3, verse 13 to 15, each one, work will become manifest. That means it will, your work here on earth will one day be shown up there. It will. Everyone. Everyone. So it says what? For the day, what is the day? The day of judgment. The day is called the day of judgment. The day where the Lord says, are you going you're gonna to open all accounts with me? And I'm going to disclose everything you do and we will settle issues and we will settle the accounts. It will happen. And he says to them, he says to them, because it will be revealed by fire. 
And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a what? Say with me now, what is that? A reward. This is not on earth, it is in heaven. Each of you will get a different reward in heaven. What you do right now, you determine what your reward will be in heaven. You set yourself up for failure or success up to you. I can't live your life, but I'm here to encourage you as a pastor who has a love for you that wants you to do well, to say, to urge you, shift the way you think. If you've not been thinking right, shift it out right now. Get ready because you can reset and reconfigure and readjust and go back to the place where you're originally supposed to be in default, serve God. Use the talent that God has given to you. He says this, if the work that the one who's built on the foundation of life, he will receive a one. If, the, if anyone's work is burned out, he will suffer loss. There is loss in heaven. There's an account. There is a gain, there is a loss. If there's no gain, there can be no loss. If there's a gain, there must be a loss. That's why I say this message today will challenge you. But you need to wake up. And not just focus on your life of your life that you have in Singapore, in Disneyland Singapore, where we live in Disneyland, this is Disneyland Singapore. And and and, and then just basically live in a micro life. Me and my problem, me and my issues, and all the stuff on Instagram and all the following and what the life are so good and mine is so small. Open your eyes for a bit. Stop looking at the screen life because there's a life that's bigger than the screen up there that you have to go to. But you're so stuck in that screen life, it's all you possess. That you forget there's a bigger life. Eternity is super long. Because heaven is bigger than your universe. It's bigger than your stupid screen. You know what? He says, you will receive a reward. If not, if your work is burned out, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only through fire. Yeah, so the issue, Matthew 25, clear, as crystal clear. It's not talking about salvation. You're going to go to heaven, but you're going to go in there, either going to sweep my house, or you're going to live in your own house. Yeah? What Pastor Gracie used to tell people, you don't want to serve, right? Never mind, you go to heaven, you'll be cleaning my toilet. Because it's a joke. But, you know, she does it out of love. Okay? And the people, no, no, no issues. They all love her. So, so, the thing is this. Is that we must understand that there are rewards in heaven, period. And you, it's up to you to earn it. Salvation, you don't have to earn. You're going up there. But what you get up there is quantifiable. It's quantifiable. And it doesn't depend on who you are and what you do. It depends on your faithfulness. You see, the currency that I talked about last week was the currency of heaven is what? What's the currency of heaven? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Be faithful to your call. Faithful to what God has done you to do. doesn't matter what the results are. Two or five, they got the same. But it's all about faithfulness. So don't get all insecure. Don't get all comparing. Don't worry if the grass is greener on the other side. If the grass is greener on the other side, what do you do? You water your own grass. Stop thinking on the other side. Stop looking at what other people are doing. Get your own life straight. But God says, I can take your life and I can make it great. You see, the, so when God gave, when he gave these two stories in Luke 19 and Matthew 25, you notice one other common thing about those two stories is that God says, I'm not dealing with your emotions. You got it. You're so hang up with your emotions. Negativity, your thought about God, your thought about things, fighting, fighting with God all the time, resisting, resisting. It's all about your emotions. But God says, you know, when he gave the one five, there was no emotion involved. Get it done. The one had two. Got it. No emotion done. Get it done. The one with the one, he's the one with the emotions. He's the one that has a problem. What's the problem of the one that didn't want to do anything? He had this problem called rationalization. 
You know, rationalization is one of the most saddest things a person can do because rationalization has three things that will happen to you. Number one, rationalization does this to you. And this is what the one did that we can learn today. Rationalization can be created by false per- perception. It will ruin your life. You see, when you are a Christian and what is spoken from the pulpit, you resist it because you want to rationalize it out of your mind, you're going to ruin your life. Because why? Rationalization has to do with creating false perception about me, about the Word, about God, about church, about anything else that you feel that come against what you want to do with your life. So you rationalize. So when you rationalize, you're trying to make what you think become the logic. But it's not. Then it becomes what? What does it become? It becomes self-deception. And who lives in self-deception? Only you. Self-deception deceives who? Only you. If you live in a fantasy, you create your own, own little mystery and you create your own little thing about God and it's not right, about church or, or about what God wants you to do. You create all these stories and you, you know what? Only you live in that story. Only you live in that story. Nobody else did because you created that story yourself. So what kind of story are you creating right now about God? about what you're called to do as a Christian. What is the responsibility of a believer? What is the call of a man and woman of God? What is your purpose in life? What are you to do? There is a truth. There is a call. It is clear. If you are to be a Christian, God says, go win souls. If you're a Christian, God says, become a disciple. If you're a Christian, God says, become a leader so that you can influence people around you. If you are a believer, what should you do? You should follow Jesus. If you believe in what you do, coming to church is not, a, is, is not an option. It's a, it's a natural thing. It's a normal thing. You know, the one, one talent, the one the one talent, you know, his job was so easy. God says, the master said, I give you only one. All you need to do is just go produce one. The one that had five, the one that had five, you have to go and produce five. The one with two, I have to go and produce two. But the one with one, his job is so easy. And you know what? They all had the same amount of time. You have time, I've got time. Whatever time you have in 24 hours, the guy with the one, the one with the two, the one with the five, you and I, we all have the same amount of time 24-7 a day, a week. That's all we have. But the one with five, he had the same amount of time as the one with one, and he went on to produce hard work, diligent, but he was serious. He was trustworthy and he was committed. He was what? He had the currency called faithfulness. I was faithful if God has given me something in my life that is of talent or worth that can be helped, can, can help to serve and to help other people, that can love people, that can love God, that can serve others. I'm going to do it. It was hard for the one to the five. But you know, the one to one was so easy. The master gave him an easy job. You, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you one, just one simple thing. The one simple thing I ask you to do this. Can you just come to church every week? Can you even do that minimal? With the one that says, can you just do that one thing for me? Would you just pray each day? Would you just read the word of God? Would you just do one thing for me? With the one, can you just love God and love me and love other people? Can you just do the one thing? You don't have to do the one of the five. You just do the one of the one. You can't even do that. You know, that's what's happening is that we find people in churches that can't even do the simple one. Oh, we need the one that struggle with it. I don't want to come to church. I only come once a month. That's enough. That's my quota. I'm going to serve. But only when I have time. If I'm not, sorry, I can't make it. Find somebody else. What is that kind of attitude coming from? It comes from a heart that doesn't believe there is a heaven, that there is a repayment, that there is a reward that they can lose or gain. It comes to them saying, God's word cannot be cannot be believed. So I'm going to create my own world about God, create my own Christianity. You might as well create your own Bible in that case. That's what happens. The one who had once created his own Bible, I'm just going to believe my master is a wicked guy, very frightening and scary, and I'm not going to follow him. I mean, I'm going I'm to rebel if I can. Because I created this whole world I thought about him, about my pastor, 
about my father, about my authority in my life. And then basically I'll live my life based on that fantasy I've created about God and about authority. That's dangerous because you are the only one living in there. Number two, rationalization, which what the one did, was used to avoid responsibility. That's why he did. I'll rationalize it out that I don't have to do what I'm called to do. Let somebody else do it, not me. And after all that God has done for you, pour into your life, give you a husband, give you a wife, give you kids, give you a career, give you money, let you stay in Singapore, let you get the BTO or the area that you wanted. Maybe you don't have it, but then too bad, never mind, just pray, okay? All right? But you know, yeah, it's like, you know, God's like pouring everything to you. And all you do is get somebody else. That's what the guy did, the number two. The guy in the five, he did it anyway. So the guy in the two did it anyway. So we got seven, right? So my, my zero, then it's okay, we still got seven, God. You know, three of us got seven. But hey, man, it's not what other people are doing. It's not what your sis and bro and sitting next to you doing. It's what are you doing? What are you doing? Don't write on somebody else's success and think that's yours. Just because you go to a bigger church doesn't mean you get all the credit, you know? You just walked into the church, that's all you did. Big deal, walking into a church of 100,000. Big deal in that. Did you do it? You're going to get credit for it? Come on, that's silly. That's not heaven's accounting. I want to build here. I want to build here. Why? Because I know what I'm building is my own that God has called me. I don't look elsewhere. I don't want my eyes fixed on something else. I know what I'm doing. Because you know what? Because I know at the end, we're all going to get the same reward no matter what platform I'm in. Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible tells me so. And so that's where my security comes from. That's where my confidence comes from. That's where my identity comes from of who I am with God. Not what He does to other people. Don't, don't let what he does for other people become your identity that you lack in. Just because he does something for somebody else means that I don't have the identity, therefore I have a lesser identity. That's a lie. God has given you identity of a child of God, a son and daughter of God. He loves you. You are treasured. You are special. You are powerful. You can do great things for God. We're going to close soon. The third thing that rationalization does is that we start to judge and become biased. When you rationalize and say, you know what, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. So you rationalize, oh, it's the do-do-do theology. Nonsense. You're rationalizing it because you want to get out of what your responsibility. So you think, you know what, no, I'm just going to do my own thing. But doing your own thing, you're basically picking and choosing. But, it's, but if everyone's going to do their own thing, then who's going to do God's thing? And so he says here, in the word here, that as we read this story here, is that people become judging and become biased, especially to those who don't agree with us. I don't agree with you because I rationalize that I, wanna, I don't want to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to resist. And so every time you tell me something that I don't want to do, I'm going to rationalize it and I'm going to judge you. I would judge you. I would judge you, Pastor. I would judge you because I don't want to do what is right, but I will create my own story so that I will be happy, so that I can justify what I'm doing. And when you come against that, I will judge you. When you judge me, and when you judge each other, you become God yourself. And that's a very dangerous place to be in. When you replace God at the judgment seat. Extremely dangerous. So you take that mind of yours, you get rid of that judging spirit, and you pull it out right now. I will not judge. I will, I will humbly listen and be teachable. And when you do that, your whole chasm of your personality changes when you become teachable. And God is looking, that is what God is looking for. The five and the two were teachable. One of the credit, one of the best things about person that increases in capacity in life is that they are teachable. They can learn and they can hear, and if it makes sense to them, they make adjustments in their life. And they make those adjustments, which is called teachability, then they grow, and the capacity grows in them. 
And that's what happens when you come, brothers and sisters, friends, to church, is that you come to be taught. You come to adjust. You come to change. You come to be shaped. And that you do not rationalize. Because when you rationalize, we will all know it. Because you will judge. See, he was blind, the third person. He was blind, blind to his laziness. You know what's, you know what's spiritual laziness? Once I had a, 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 a pastor friend that I was helping, was running a church, and I said to him this, I said, you know, let me ask you a question. What happens to you, as I was mentoring him, so, so when I mentor people, I'm always asking questions because you self-discover. I don't use the style of telling you what to do. That's not mentoring. You need to discover yourself. So I asked him that question. What would you do if you died tomorrow? What would happen to your church? Oh, um, yeah, very simple. If I die tomorrow, the churches disperse. Everyone goes to another church. There's, you know, 500 churches in Singapore. They can go to different churches. Everything's fine. They'll all be good. They'll all be good. To me, that's called lazy ministry. It's very easy. I come, I'm anointed, I preach. What you all do is your business. When I die, fine go, you know, do whatever you want. That's lazy ministry. You know what's heart ministry? What is supposed to be heart ministry and the right ministry? You train the next generation. You, when I train the next generation, it will take a lot of my time. It will take my resources. It will take time for my house. It, I will have to, I will, it will be a cost to me. It will cost me if I want to raise the next generation. But you know what? That's the right thing to do. In this house of God, we raise the next generation. Amen? Come on, give God a hand. We give everybody a chance to serve. We want them to become leaders. We want them, as what Dowdy always says, stand on my shoulders so that you can go higher. Yeah, that my floor is their, my, my ceiling is their floor. Right? And that's what we want. It takes work. It's hard work. It takes a lot of time. It takes sacrifices. But this is not lazy ministry. Because you're doing it for God. You're not doing it for anybody else. That's what my heart desires is. So when I see these girls and guys here doing immerse, leading immerse, when they lead immerse, I clap, I applaud. Wow, wow, my, my leader, wow, gonna be better than me. When these guys do worship, whew, wow, they're gonna be better than the next, the previous batch. Excellent. That's what we are. That's what we are. That's what that's called reproducing. That's what it means to, to bring the five to another five. The one to the ten in the, the other example. That's called multiplication. That is called kingdom's accounting because it will compound, amen? It will compound. When I reach to the 500 next week, I believe they're going to reach 50,000 because it will compound, amen? It will compound. The kingdom of God's math, is, it will compound. If you don't know what compound is, go and ask Chet GPT, all right? Okay? But it will compound. So, Last thing that I want to warn us is not to be like the third one who didn't multiply. Because when you don't multiply, and when God is calling you, and God is reaching out to you, and you don't want to come back, and you don't want to do what God wants you to do, you know what you are? There's three things about a person that's described in here in the words that the person said. The last one, what he said. The words that he said described in three things about him. Number one, he's a hoarder. He hoards. He hoards, and he doesn't want to give. When you're a hoarder, you don't want to give because you don't trust. So are you going to be a hoarder in life? Hoarding your time? Hoarding your resources? Just from God because I'm a hoarder? A hoarder can never prosper. Can never prosper. Don't hoard. You want a road, you want a road to prosperity in every part of your life, your career and all that, which a lot of my young people have? Don't hoard. This one, one guy said this to me. He said once, he said, Pastor, I want to confess to you something. This was years ago. He says, you know, I want to confess to you this. I, and I, was always, I, was, I, was, I was always afraid to tithe because I was, I was afraid that I wouldn't have enough and I hoard. He says, when I did that, my career struggled all the time. True story. Struggled all the time. He says, you know, but finally I decided one day I was convicted by the Holy Spirit to tithe. And I gave that tithe. And after that, I got promoted and promoted and promoted. And today he's a managing director. All right? It's a true story. Okay? And so, why? Because he decided not to hoard. Don't hoard. When you hoard, means you don't trust. And you don't trust the master, who you're going to trust. Next thing about the person with the one, he hide. 
he likes to hide. So he hid. I hid, I hid the, the talent you gave to me. He didn't want to lose it. That's an excuse. You know, that's what happens to us when we're called out by God and God is trying to reach out to us. We hide. Why do we hide? Hope he doesn't see me. Hope, hope I sit right at the back and then pastor, you know, doesn't see me at all, you know. So they hide. And when you hide, you think you can avoid. Sure, you can avoid, but you can't run away from God. At the end of the day, you catch up to you. That's what Jonah tried to do, right? Hide, run, 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 run to Joppa all the way to the, to the furthest end of, of the civilized world in Europe. Try to get away from God, but God still found it out. So now I want to tell you today, are you going to hide? Are you going to hoard? Don't do that with God. Don't hoard your life from God. Don't hoard it. Say, God, I want to serve you. God chose you. You have to choose God as well. Don't pick and choose with God, man. Don't ever pick and choose with God. Because when you try to pick and choose with God, you know what? He also can pick and choose what, what's going to be the outcome of your life. So you decide. So instead, as we close, be like those leaders, the one who had two and the five. What did they do with your life? You know one thing, true, is that God values faithfulness. Faithful in what has He called you to do presently. If you can do what is present with the one, with the two, you can do it well, He's going to give you more. Because He sees that. Be tested by God. Faithfulness will always bring you increase. Period. Full stop. Just remember this. Faithfulness will bring increase in your life. In every part of your life. In any relationship. Faithfulness brings increase. And so when you remember that, this is the story that tells us this. They faithfully did it. What did the master say? Here, I'm going to give you more. Okay? Next thing that happens to great leaders who are faithful, when you're faithful, he increases, he gives you more. What happens when he gives you more? Next thing that's happened to you, you want to be a leader in life, in office? You want to be a leader in life, in career? You will have an increase in a thing called capacity. Capacity is vital for anyone that wants to do well in any part of life. You want to be an entrepreneur? You want to be a businessman? You want to be a really uh, a a corporate climbing executive, you need to increase your capacity. All right? To increase the capacity, you got to first be faithful. God is the one that rewards faithfulness. He brings increase. When the increase comes, you will then have to be able to contain the increase. And it comes when He gives you the capacity. And so when God gives you more responsibility, Reward is responsibility, by the way. Reward means responsibility, okay? Reward doesn't mean, you know, it's going to give you DBS stocks, okay? All right? Okay, God's going to give you more responsibility. That means there's an increase in capacity. And when you are a person with greater capacity in your life, you will be very influential in life. Influencing your boss, influencing your customer, influencing your downline, Upline, whatever line, sideline, whatever it is, it will be influenced because you have the capacity now. So it starts with this, guys. Everything God says to you has not only got to do with whether you are a car park marshal worship leader. Here, the message here is for you when you go out there Monday to Sun, Saturday or Friday when you work out there. Faithfully do it. Do it well. Be a producer. God will then give you more and then the capacity will come. Then you won't feel lousy about yourself. I'm a loser. Everyone's achieving in life. Everyone's gone forward. Where am I right now? You can start here in the house of God. This is the best training ground to be a leader. Nobody else out there is going to give you an opportunity to be a leader. Okay, everyone wants to, out there wants to kill you and make sure that they overtake you. This place, we celebrate your success. We celebrate your children's success. This is what it's about. It's a, not a competition here. This is a place where we cooperate in a community here. So, so what are you going to do? So I say this to you as we close. God says to every single one of you, your first responsibility, if you are a believer, you're a Christian, win souls for Jesus. That's your responsibility, number one. That's one talent throwing out there. Are you going to take it? Number two, he's saying to you right now, I'm going to give you responsibilities as you serve. 
and how is, how is God going to see that tangibility? Easy. God made it very easy for you. Serve in your life net. Be part of a life net. Serve in church where there is a need. Go meet that need in church. How are you going to do that? Serve the community out there in the world that you are in. As you do that, you're going to be able to be my representative. Number three, if you truly say you're a Christian, he's going to say to you, how are you representing me as a Christian out there? What kind of life are you leading? Are you embarrassed to say that you're a Christian on your Instagram so that you lose all your followers? Are you, or you're all, or are you going to say, I'm going to follow Jesus instead? You know, these things are very important. Are we embarrassed about being a Christian? No, are you saying, you know what? I'm a Christian. Yes. I go everywhere. I, t- I, tell them, I tell everybody I'm a Christian. So now, the question is today, what are you going to do? So I'd like us to do this one thing. We leave NLCC when we come on Sunday to take an action. So can we stand right now? Let's have an action taken. Are you a born again believer and a Christian? If the answer is yes, then you say this to the Lord. God, whatever talents you've given to me, whatever call you have in my life, let's go, let's do it together. Let's go for it. With the little I'm doing right now, Lord, I'm going to bring increase by your grace. And Lord, I know there's more responsibility after that. And the more responsibility after that. When I get to heaven, Lord, there's going to be more responsibility. And Lord, I I know that's going to be my life. But I do it because I love you. I'm willing to follow you, Lord. And God... If I'm the one with the one talent, tell the Lord this right now. I'll start from here. Simple things, basic Christian things like coming to church on time, coming to church regularly. If in Singapore you're not sick, come and be with God's people. Let it be just a given in life, a given. Don't even have to negotiate. No emotions involved. Just got to do the right thing. Just got to do the right thing in life. God, this is my one talent to you. Love people. Be part of a life net. Serve me where I can, Lord. Lord, Father, I, I, want, I want to be used by you, Lord. And I know, Lord, Father, you're building me in maturity, Lord. I don't want to be a baby Christian. I don't want to be a, a warm, a, a pew warmer. I don't want to just be warming a seat on Sunday. I want to do something in my life that has meaning, that has got purpose, that, that is significant in your kingdom. Lord, show me today. Use me, Lord, God. Whatever world I created about you, whatever image I created about you, whatever, Lord, I'm going to throw it all out the, the window. I trust you. I trust you. You're a good God that loves me. And these stories you tell, Lord, Father, are stories that are meant for me to hear and to be teachable, Lord. And God, I just pray right now, Lord, Father, that I that all these words that flew, flew out of my mouth, Lord Father, that it will touch the soul of these people, that it will be seeds into their hearts, Lord, and that it will bring change. It will bring them to a place of maturity, Lord, maturity as a Christian, Lord Father. We don't want baby Christians. We want mature Christians, Lord, men and women of God, solid, Lord, solid, Lord, leaders, Lord Father. Build the house of God, Lord. We pray, Lord Father. And those of you who do not know Jesus, have been away from God or it's or backslidden or know that you know you are like the father who's the one you need to repent you need to repent today and turn back your ways and to turn back to God and pray that prayer of forgiveness and make a decision to turn your heart to God so if you're not a believer if you're backslidden or you're like the person with the one pray this prayer let's pray together with the rest of them let's pray together with them right now say Lord Jesus forgive me if I've been like the one Lord I thank you for the word today, it will bring change. It will bring shift. It will bring a decision. Holy Spirit, come and touch my heart. Let the fire of God come into my heart to live for you. If this is my church, I will build here, Lord. I know you put me here for a reason this t- today. That I'm here today because of you. So Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes me clean.
that I have new life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God a praise. Thank you.
decided to follow Jesus. You sing much better than me. Come on. Believe it. Decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me. The cross before me. today. Lord, those that are here, those that are watching, bless them, Lord. We pray. Lord God, I want to thank you for their heart of submission, their heart of teachability, and their desire to want to learn, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. You're shaping us. You're molding us into your image and likeness. You're increasing our capacity, Lord, that we're going to be influential in the world around us. We're going to be the head and not the tail, Lord. God, that we're going to be able to do things that we thought we cannot, but because of you, we can, Lord. Father, there's going to be multiplication in their lives. And Lord, as long as they're faithful, Lord, Father, they're trustworthy, Lord, I know you're going to deposit and increase their capacity, Lord. Lord, in every facet of life, in love life, in work life, in money life, in any part of life as a citizen, as a person who's traveling, Lord, God, I use them, Lord. Father, we just pray that through their lives, Lord, Father, that people can see Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everyone here. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you next week. Bring your friends. There'll be prayer as well.